I am David Helwig, or so they tell me. And if I can win the battle between my bifocals and my text, I will say what I have to say as clearly as possible. Standing by the rail of the ferry, as the ship approached the north shore of the St. Lawrence River, I was reminded of the presence of that great river in the history and literature of our country. Historians have argued that the geographic position of the St. Lawrence helped to create the east and west nation of Canada against the north and south flow of traffic to the United States. As I zipped up my jacket that day against the river's chill, I observed the white tips of waves in the distance, or thought I did. No, I decided. There wasn't enough wind that afternoon to create white caps. I was seeing something else. I decided the white flashes I could just make out against the dark gray-green of the St. Lawrence must be belugas, the white whales. On a previous crossing, I had seen a single one at a distance, or thought so. But this was the first time I had observed a pod. It was probably a group of females with calves. Beluga mothers have the habit of gathering close to the path of the regular ferry from Riviere du Loup to saint simeon The water is shallower there and warmer in the lee of an island, and the calves are happier away from the coldest and deepest zones. All this happened some years ago now. We were on our way to eastern Ontario that summer afternoon. Each year we made the trip, sometimes stopping for the night along the shore of the St. Lawrence. At Tadoussac, we planned to observe some of the great whales that feed at the mouth of the Saguenay Fjord, and among them, the enchanting, peremptory white belugas. More than half of the existing members of that species are found in Canadian waters. Peremptory, I said of them, meaning they demand our attention. What is it that is so special about whales? Partly their size, and perhaps the sense that these vast, warm-blooded mammals are less alien to us than most of the cold-blooded species inhabiting the deeps of the sea. In order to reach Tadoussac by car, you cross the Saguenay on a local ferry, and as we drove onto the boat, a whole pod of ivory pale belugas suddenly appeared, rising to the surface to breathe, their skin shining and brilliant under the afternoon sun, so white, so very perfectly white. Later, at the local Museum of Maritime Mammals, I bought a French text, then spent the evening racing through pages of fascinating detail about the creatures who had greeted us. Some few of the thousand to 1,400 belugas who inhabit the St. Lawrence estuary. Since my childhood, I have been fascinated by wild creatures. The sense of wonder I felt observing the belugas was elaborated in the French text I held in my hands, the biological complexities spelling out what I can only call the poetry of their being. I once considered the study of wild animals as a career, but what I wanted was not to measure, enumerate, to perform analytical autopsies, but to explore the feeling roused by these marvels, less a matter of research than something higher and stranger. The belugas are white to blend the floating ice. They carry a heavy insulation of fat. The calves are dark brown at birth, but during the second year they become blue-gray, gradually becoming marbled. By the time females are five years old, the males eight or nine, they are a pure ivory white. They possess a skeleton impregnated with oil and a skin that enhances their hydrodynamic performance. Apparently, they are possessed of the most complex and sophisticated system of echolocation among their kind, sending out the widest range of sounds and reading the echoes with astonishing sophistication. They are gregarious creatures, and when the female gives birth, she is surrounded by other females who will nudge the newborn calf to the surface to take its first breath. As I passed the evening reading about all of this, 
My mind was electric with the memory of the explosive flashes of whiteness, close beside us that afternoon as the animals broke the surface to breathe. What we saw that summer day has stayed with me, one of the mystic tales that evoke the natural history of our country and its great river. I once wrote a poem about the mysteries of nationality and patriotism. To have a country, the poem says, is to have a way to encounter history in the streets of a burning city whose fire is our own. But on this occasion, I was stirred, not by creative and destructive fires, but by life in the river at the watery border of my native land, the rarities it brings to us. Peremptory, I said. They demand our attention. We are driven to consider their history and their future. Many of you already know the news. Having survived hunting, even a deliberate attempt to wipe out the St. Lawrence population in the mistaken belief that they harmed the fishery, the estuary belugas are now, like many species at the top of the food chain, so damaged by pollution that they may be doomed. The calves are poisoned by the chemicals in their mother's milk. The tale is not unique. Some variation of it is told of species from monarch butterflies to African elephants. But when I recall that pod of belugas, I remember them as sudden, mysterious creatures, pure white, coming up to the air to breathe with us. To observe them is an experience that sets aside, strangely aside, the world, an observation that holds us at a distance and yet grips our senses and brings us close. Is this what you could call an absolute of being? Or is it only the hopeless echo of a lost poetry? Thank you.